Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Dan Howe. On today's program, we take an in-depth look at two important programs, the National Student Poets Program and Letters About Literature. Both programs encourage young people to read and express themselves through their writing, and both are sponsored by national library programs, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and the Library of Congress. When we return, we'll meet some of these remarkable young students who take part in both programs. Welcome to Understood.org, a free online resource for parents of kids with learning and attention issues with personalized recommendations, tools, and expert advice. The National Poets Program is a national initiative by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers. It's designed to promote writing and academic success and links aspiring poets with neighborhood resources such as museums and libraries. In 2018, the program recognized five students as national student poets. One of those is Daniel Block of Birmingham, Alabama, and he's with us today. Daniel, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Stan. Well, so tell me about the National Student Poets Program. How has, how has it affected you? Well, uh, I think the, the big change is that it's given me an opportunity to think about community service in a very different way, kind of to reflect on what I want to do. Um, honestly, if I hadn't uh, been chosen as a national student poet, I probably wouldn't be doing much community service right now. Uh, but as it's part of the program, I have had to, first of all, travel to high schools and elementary schools and teach poetry there, but also come up with my own community service project that I want to develop and execute. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I've really had to reflect on what communities I want to introduce to poetry, uh, who I feel might be underserved and who might really need access to poetry now. Um, and it's, it's been very worthwhile and uh, it's, it's really paid off for me to be able to think about how I can make a difference and how I can help. Now, your parents are immigrants. You're a first generation American. How has that affected your life? I think that it's affected my life um, by giving me a very different kind of view maybe of the American experience and just kind of, I guess I've always kind of seen life from, from a little bit of an outsider perspective because growing up in Alabama, there's not a lot of other Russian Americans there. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I grew up near my family and I kind of saw them struggle because they still had their heavy accents and they couldn't adapt to that language so easily. Um, and so I kind of always saw you know, saw their perspective on things, and it was very different from maybe the, the standard Alabama perspective. And I think that gave me kind of this need to voice their experiences, to write about them, and to, to introduce other people to their voice, to share what they've been through. And I think that was really one of the main, you know, that's one of the main subjects that's driven my poetry. Uh, most consistently, I've returned to writing about my family again and again, because I've just found that you know, many people don't quite understand what they've been through and don't understand the, you know, complex experience of uh, coming to a country that's so different from your home, but at the same time valuing that country for, for taking you in and for letting you kind of escape from a lot of the dark things in your homeland. Um, so I think that in that way, their immigration kind of gave me an impulse to write and create and share their stories. In addition to English, you speak Russian. Yes. So how has that affected your poetry, and do you write in both languages? I don't write in both languages. I actually recently got a suggestion from a friend of mine to, to try that, to try writing in Russian and see if I have kind of a different style in that, which I'd love to do. Mm -hmm. I do think, though, that uh, even though I haven't written in Russian, just growing up with Russian as my first language and having that kind of bilingual upbringing, I think it made me maybe pay more attention to the nuances of, of sound in language. And it gave me this kind of rhythmic sensibility that very much drives my poetry today. I, you know, things like the images that I pull up and, you know, the, the, all these little stylistic elements, uh, all of those I still have to figure out, you know, they're very much in development. But rhythm is something that I've always felt is very much kind of a part of my poetic style and it, it guides what sentences I'm led to. And I think I really owe that to just 
being able to kind of go back and forth between these languages. When did you start writing? I started writing in first grade, I would say. That's kind of my earliest memory because I was reading some fantasy books then. And whenever I read a fantasy book or, or watch a movie or something like that, I, I really want to create something like mm -hmm. it. And so I immediately, you know, after reading those fantasy books, I tried to write my own on my dad's mm -hmm. computer and I would always, I couldn't get past the first chapter. But it was, <laughs> it was really exhilarating and I've kept writing since then. Why poetry? I think because for that same reason, I started reading poetry and I found myself just really in love with it and amazed by all these turns of language, these wonderful images, phrases that would just kind of stay in my head for such a long time. And uh, as with the fantasy novels, I just felt this need to kind of to emulate that and try my hand at it. And uh, I've stayed, you know, loving mm -hmm. to read poetry since then, so I've stayed writing poetry. Was there a moment when you said to yourself, this is what I want to do. I don't think there was an exact moment. I think it was just that it, it became clear since my childhood, just loving writing so much, uh, it became clear that I just could not not do it. Uh, whenever I would see some media that I loved, it would, it would push me to write. Uh, and so I think I just realized, you know, that's when I felt most excited, most exhilarated and happy. Uh, and so... It's not really a conscious decision, it's just what I would, I, what I would always go to um, as kind of my happy space. And, um, you know, regardless of whether I work in poetry in the future or whether it's just kind of a hobby that I keep up, I know I'll continue writing to some degree. As a uh, high school senior, yeah. you're already a published author. Tell me about that. Uh, well, that process... Um, has, I, I owe a lot to my high school. I go to the Alabama School of Fine Arts, uh, which is this kind of magnet school in Birmingham, uh, where there are these different departments, such as uh, there's a math science department, surprisingly. There's dance, theater, music, visual arts, and creative writing. And um, coming to the creative writing program was really the first time I started sharing my work, uh, because I had to with my teachers. And my teachers, uh, they kind of saw, at that time I was writing personal essays, and one of my teachers really liked them and was like, hey, book contest. It was a local book contest. Um, and she was like, you should, you should throw your essays here. And I was like, okay. And so I you know, took a few hours, just put them all in one kind of collection, titled it, and I sent it to the contest. And then a few months later, I found out that I had won and I was getting published. <laughs> um, and great. yeah, it was, it was really great. And it was a lot of fun. It was a local contest. And so the book didn't see a super wide release or anything. Right. But it's still great to see my words in print. And... Since then, I have published two uh, small chapbooks of poetry, one from Diode Editions and one from Lit City Press. And those were also through various publishing contests. Those are small presses, but they have a little bit more of a wide audience. Um, but again, the process was really kind of the same. I was just compiling work and receiving positive feedback from my teachers. And I was like, there's some kind of thematic consistency here. Why don't I just put it together and, and send it and see what happens? How do you balance your writing with your personal life? It's really difficult. I think it's, it's very difficult. Um, it's something that I've, I've struggled to figure out, and I don't think I have it figured out, because uh, being a teenager, I mean, I'm sure this is true at any age, but especially being a teenager, I feel indebted to my family to spend a certain amount of time with them. I feel, you know, a certain amount of obligation to my school to try there. I have obligation to my friends and schoolmates to you know, keep up my relationships with them and, and hang out with them outside of school. And so there's kind of all these different things that feel a little bit more immediate than poetry because poetry can be such a, you know, you can kind of hammer at it every day for a hundred days and not come up with a single good poem. And then in just one flurry of inspiration, you might come up with something great and, and it's done. And so it's so much more unpredictable that I've I think I've struggled, especially lately, uh, setting myself enough time to really to write and let myself blossom creatively. Do so, you ever do you ever get write, writer's block? Yes, I I do. Um, how do you how do you deal with that? I, you know, it's interesting. I think I I almost always have writer's block in a way um, because if I were to just sit down and write about something. Uh, if that was kind of the assignment given to me, I would just kind of hit a stone wall. 
what I really work off of is uh, writing prompts, which I get from my teachers, but also I think lately I figured out how to come up with them myself. Uh, and that's just kind of finding a, a concept, maybe like right from the perspective of a fireplace or write, write a sonnet. Um, maybe know, write about the latest thing that delighted you. These are all prompts that lately I've kind of found uh, inspirational. And, and I start writing that poem, and it's while writing it that I figure out how it connects to something in my life, how it relates to a certain conflict I'm experiencing, a certain emotion that I want to express. And that's really how I get over uh, writer's block. I just set myself a mission, and, uh, and then I accomplish it. What advice do you have for other aspiring writers? I would say, I would say um, definitely, you know, find some prompts and use those because it's, I found that it's not sustainable to just work on inspiration because that is just so, so unpredictable. And so you really kind of need to, to keep at it and um, use those prompts and force yourself to write. I would also say don't be intimidated to put your work out there because I really, you know, those early books that I published, I just kind of threw them out there because why not? And then they ended up getting published. I had absolutely no idea that that was possible. And the same thing with National Student Poets. I, you know, the only reason it happened is I submitted to the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards through which National Student Poets is run. Um, and they picked me out of all their poetry submissions and put me in a pool of finalists. And then from there, I was picked as the Southeast representative. I had no clue any of that was going to happen. I was just hoping maybe for like a regional gold key for a poem of mine, you know, right. something small. And, and then all of this happened. So I would say, don't expect too much of yourself. Uh, just submit, get your work out there to see what happens. Let me ask you this. What impact has library, a library had on your life? Have libraries helped your writing and helped you scholastically? I think it's absolutely, I remember going to the Homewood Public Library, which was uh, the library in our area, as well as the Birmingham Public Library. And uh, I remember just spending a lot of time looking through, a lot of times it was comic books, honestly. Um, Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, right. And a lot of times fantasy books, just kind of, I spent a lot of time reading and a lot of time just looking at shelves and being fascinated by books. And having a space with just so much uh, possibility to explore, you know, to, to find one book and, and really love it and then, you know, look up what else by that author is in the library and kind of go just down this rabbit hole of reading. That's something I spent a lot of hours on uh, as a child. But I think I owe my writing career to that because, as I was saying, those moments of falling in love with books are the moments that later on led to me thinking, hey, I, I want to write a book. I want to write my own fantasy novel or write my own comic. And, mm -hmm. and I owe my kind of career as a writer to that. One last question. Yeah. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? I think, I think that um, I don't have a perfect idea of, of where I want to be. I know that to some extent, I will continue to have this impulse to write, and I will continue to be making poetry. Um, I also know that poetry isn't really a job of itself. I don't think that you can just be a poet. I think that you need something else that fuels you artistically. Uh, I had a conversation, which I owe uh, National Student Poets, for, I had a conversation with Tracy K. Smith, our National Poet Laureate, um, and I was thinking about college at that point, and I asked her, do you think that poets should, or writers in general, should go to school for writing? And she said that no, she thought that poets should, um, you know, should continue to learn about writing, but that shouldn't be their focus, that they should try to grab all these different things, learn about history, learn about music, learn about math, and learn about science, and be able to have this rich pool of knowledge that they can, that they can pull from uh, for inspiration. And I know that I want to kind of carry that sentiment with me into the rest of my life. I want to find a career that maybe isn't centered around poetry, but that gives me the experiences and artistic fuel that I will later take into my poetry. Daniel, good luck with your poetry. Good luck with your career. Thank you so much. And thanks for being with us. Thank you. We'll have more on Libraries Today right after this. 
It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. Every year, thousands of elementary, middle school, and high school students from all across the country take part in Letters About Literature. Letters About Literature is a national reading and writing program which asks students to read a book, poem, or speech, and then write a letter to the author, living or dead, describing how the author's work affected their life. For the 26th consecutive year, the program has been sponsored by the Library of Congress, the West Virginia Library Commission, and the West Virginia Center for the Book. Student letters were judged at both the state and national levels, and awards have been handed out. This year, 166 West Virginia students were honored for their work in the program and were recognized at ceremonies at the Culture Center on state capitol grounds in May. Let's listen to some of these award-winning letters. Claire Seibert of the Lindsley School in Wheeling is the top honors winner for Level 2, Grades 7 and 8. She wrote her letter to Shel Silverstein for his book, The Giving Tree. Dear Shel Silverstein, One of the first books I ever read was The Giving Tree. I read it to myself so many times I knew the story by heart. It wasn't until a couple of years ago I knew there was a connection between the tree and I. I felt the tree's sorrow and disguised happiness. In your story, the tree keeps giving and giving to a little boy who gives nothing in return. The tree would do anything for the boy so that they can remain friends, but the boy doesn't care as long as he get what he wants. In the story, the tree gives away all of her apples, twigs, and her entire drunk trunk so the boy could be happy and spend time with them. The boy left time and time again and left the tree on their own. It wasn't until the boy came for the very last time she gave him all she had, a stump to sit on. Like the tree and the boy, I used to have a toxic relationship with a girl in my class. Since I was so shy, almost nobody talked to me, and I was on my own. That was, until the girl appeared like an angel in the sky. She showed me kindness and asked if we could be friends. We had sleepovers, hung out at school, and made sure to sit by each other during classes. Unfortunately, I didn't see her true form until later. Every day she would call me names, play mean pranks on me, and talk about me behind my back to our peers. I would hear her vicious remarks from the classmates she told, and asked her every time why she would do that to me. Every time she apologized and said it was a joke and didn't mean any harm. I got into a deep funk and didn't know how to come out. I didn't tell my parents, and I certainly did not tell my teachers. How could I? She was my best friend, wasn't she? When I was looking through a bookshelf at my school, I saw your book and decided to read it again. After all, it had been so long. I got to the end and thought to myself, wow, I can't believe the tree so wanted to be friends with a boy who was so awful to her. Then it hit me like a piano in a Looney Tunes episode. I was the giving tree and this girl was the greedy boy. It was hard for me to imagine because I thought we were best friends. But I came to the conclusion she was only using me for compliments. There was one quote that I thought was important. And the tree was happy, but not really. I really felt like there was a click when I read that quote. I described exactly how I felt. Maybe I thought it was happy at the time, but all along, I knew this wasn't what friendship was like. Friends don't lie and stab each other in the back. Your book helped me with getting out of a horrible relationship and letting me know when enough was enough. Thank you for helping me see the poison in my life. Thank you for helping me lift my spirits and become the outgoing extrovert I now am. You probably intended for the book to have the impression of friendship lasts forever, but I got a different theme. Don't let anyone take your happiness away. From now until the end of time, I will always remember how this book changed my life for the better. You brought back the light in my life. Sincerely, Claire Seibert. As a top honors winner, Claire advances to the national competition in Washington, D.C. later this year. Caden Upton of South Charleston High School received 
honorable mention recognition in level three, that's grades nine through 12, for her letter to Lynn manuel Miranda and his Love is Love sonnet. Dear Lynn manuel Miranda, I still remember watching the 70th annual Tony Awards on June 12, 2016. Emotions coursed through me and my inner interest desperately clung to each and every song, moment, and speech. I chased after each word, I yearned for each little note, and I cheered for every talented person who cried as they gratefully relayed their speeches. However, one specific moment wrapped itself around my heart and squeezed so tightly that my tears painted a picture in its honor. It became my mantra, a sonnet that I whispered to myself every few days to keep myself going in the toughest of times. It was your speech your amazingly beautiful sonnet to your wife and the victims of a death too soon. On a rainy Monday evening in the middle of June, sitting with my dad in our newly cleaned brown couch, I sobbed as your words flowed through me. You touched me with your speech. You changed me. In the midst of the summer of 2016, I was still reeling from the recent death of my grandmother, Gammy, as I called her, after a battle with complications because of her smoking habit. Gammy and I had been inseparable. Most of my Wednesdays were spent with her in her little apartment, reading stories, cooking food, and enjoying each other's company. She encouraged my interests and adored my talents. She was my hero. Her death sent me into a downward spiral. My best friend had passed, and the amazing memories she left with me were tainted in a gray hue. The music we listened to together sounded sour. My hands no longer wrote as fast. I didn't sing as much. My world darkened. Despite the depression that infiltrated my thoughts and confined my head in thick cotton, I kept going. However, nothing was the same. When I heard your speech, memories came rushing back to me. Everything felt brighter, more intense, just on the right side of sharp. Now fill the world with music, love, and pride stayed with me for months after. I could hear my grandmother in your words. I could hear her voice in every rhyme, every stanza, every line. I listened to your speech for hours on end, repeating and repeating until I would fall asleep to your chant of love is love is love is love is love. I went to bed each night feeling that her arms were back around me. In a time where everything in my life had dulled, the light of your speech, the change, the determination, the love fueled me. My world grew brighter. You sing Vanessa's symphony, Eliza tells her story, and I remember my best friend. Even in times when every aspect of life seemed to push against her, my grandmother raised her head strong and continued on with a smile. I strive to be her. Even when the world strikes me down, when senseless acts of tragedy shake the foundation of life, I will carry on. I sing for her, I write for her, but most importantly, I love for her. Acceptance is weaved into strands of my hair because of her. Kindness is embedded under my fingernails. I trust in my talents because of her. I love myself because of her. Your speech changed my life for the better. In a time of terror, tragedy, hate, and loss, you brought me back. You repainted the memories I had long since erased. You held my hand and led me back to the one I had lost. You showed me how much she loved me. You showed me things I had forgotten. I can never thank you enough for being my hidden support when she was gone. She lives in your words. Someday, I am going to be in your shoes. I strive every day to better myself. The limelight calls me. Someday, I'll get there. It's only a matter of time. Each step of the way, you are with me. Each step of the way, she is with me. It's my turn to speak. I won't let my voice be silenced like those before me, including her. She told my story. Now I must tell hers. Much love, Caden Upton. And finally today, we hear from Caroline Higginbottom of the Lindsley School. She's an honorable mention winner in level one, grades four through six, and she wrote her letter to Marissa Meyer for the book, The Lunar Chronicles. Dear Marissa Meyer, I had absolutely no idea when I picked up one of your books that my way of thinking would never be the same. It took work to stretch my mind around the plot. 
I have never before even had the slightest bit of trouble imagining a story setting, at least since I learned to read. Usually it is easy. Your books, however, presented more of a challenge, and that means I grew my capabilities. I learned to imagine things more complex than ever, such as being cyborg, living on a satellite, or becoming queen of the moon. It is impossible for me to go back to one I didn't think in such vivid detail. My mind has more depth to it than it has ever had in my entire life. When I finished Heartless, I looked on the back to see what else you had written. When I saw the Lunar Chronicles, I decided to check them out of my local library because I had nothing better to do over the summer than read, and I'd read practically all the books I owned. I didn't know even in the slightest how much that decision would affect me. I completely underestimated what I was about to read. I had no idea I'd be inspired to make it happen like I am now. By that, I don't mean I want to find a person to be a tyrannical queen, develop platymosis, and discover mind control, of course, but rather I want to be one of the scientists who makes it possible to live on the moon. I want to make androids like Ico and ID chips like all Earthens have in the books. You quite possibly changed my career path with your books. The moon is my destination, and I hope to contribute to the process of turning Luna into a country or city, a permanent home, or a tourist destination, or both. Previously, I didn't want to be involved with space at all. I especially didn't want to leave Earth. I could program robots for the ships, or calculate dimensions, or engineer the biodomes, or a pod ship, or a satellite. I could even just develop one thing for the trip and be content. It would have to actually help, of course. I wouldn't be considered a big part of the process for a notebook. I would probably, though, if I helped develop the space rovers or a ship like the Rampion. For a short period of time, I was Cinder. I was Scarlet. I was Cress and Zia of Kelsey and Levana and Kai. It showed me how cruelly people can be treated just because they're different. Now I can understand better when a friend is being bullied. I can also understand my own situation better. Because I like school and homework, I don't fit in with other with other kids my age. I've been called strange, unnatural, and crazy. I've even been labeled as an alien when Cinder actually was, sort of. It shows me that I may be different, but at least I'm probably human. I will never forget what the future may look like or the world I've been introduced to. I can be more sympathetic, imagine more vividly, and maybe even change the world around me. Thanks to scientists' work, maybe me included, Regular people may be able to live on the moon and have ID chips in the future. My work will not stop until either I'm gone or there are people on the moon. My world is now brighter thanks to you. Sincerely, Caroline Hickenbottom. Some of West Virginia's most gifted young students take part in the Letters About Literature program, and it has been a pleasure to hear from three of them today. We'll be back with more on Libraries Today after this. Today we had a chance to hear from some remarkable students. Daniel Block writes poetry, is a published author, and through his poetry, reaches out to the world. The letters about literature students we heard from today experienced the joy of reading a good book and then put their thoughts and feelings about it down on paper. All of these young people have shown us how impactful reading and writing can truly be. I'm Stan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.